virus and biopolitics, a view from the body. I do have a photo that inspired the opening part of this presentation, but I, it, actually the photo is not as important as what's written on it, so I guess we can all do without, <laughs> without seeing the photo. So I want to start this presentation with that photo. I took it recently while on vacation near Omish, which is a famous little city just out of, outside of Split. And it says, it's a big graffiti, like a transparent. It says in English, the emergency will replace the contemporary. In the middle of this old town, spread by an unknown author, it is an example, I believe, of the permeating awareness of how the state of emergency shapes the global contemporary, and especially after the 2009-2008 economic crisis. In the age of COVID-19 outbreak, um, the emergency seems to me to be the state of the contemporary with all spheres of life being either suspended or constricted. However, and this is a nod toward the opening this presentation seeks to find, the emergency in the contemporary has also been framed by political protests from the US to Slovenia, from Belarus to Hong Kong. Despite the lockdown, many have endangered their own freedoms to protest oppressive political regimes. Others, however, have protested lockdowns more specifically decrying them as portents of the end of democracy, from Berlin to Zagreb, from Denver to London. Uh, the so-called freedom festivals celebrate democracy, but without solidarity towards those affected by the virus, and are indeed often touting conspiracy theories against global efforts to produce inoculation. Indeed, the contemporary seems hot, it seems tense, and above all, it is full of urgency. As Lasta will tell us more tomorrow, this time of urgency, necessity, and emergency pushes political concepts to their brink. Okay. So we, what we have to do is we must think them again and again in a sort of a perpetual recursivity, perpetual motion. With that in mind, I ask if we can kind of swim in this boiling soup of events and concepts to gain more power of understanding the world. Hannah Arendt can teach us a lot about necessity and urgency, especially in relation to the political. How can we live permanently in the contemporary whose main feature is urgency or necessity? What will it do to politics? My intention here is not to answer directly these two questions, but to steer this presentation towards a new direction where Martin and I will be thinking about what makes the biopolitics in the age of COVID-19. Our contention is that beyond conspiracy theories or authoritarianism, or even reviving of the spirit of protest and anti-government activities, the COVID-19 pandemic, hereafter the coronavirus pandemic, presents two important conclusions for political thought. A, that more care has to be given to understanding politics in a non-human centric way. And B, that dominant understandings of the biopolitical paradigm, for example, Thanato politics, have been challenged profoundly by the pandemic or by the virus itself. These two conclusions are also challenges to political theory that will hopefully yield stronger engagements with different modes of being, alter ontologies, different frames of existence, and also what Donna Haraway calls making kin, open and end quote, in a new way she terms the Cthulhu scene. Without entering Haraway's own theorizing of the scene, we can contend with the unknown author from above that the challenges and conclusions presented earlier are in many ways the most striking feature of our contemporary. With that in mind, the research question guiding this research is, how can we understand biopolitics when presented with virus as a performative non-human agent? Despite what the title might indicate, this presentation is not an overview of biopolitical theorizing in the face of COVID-19 or coronavirus, although it does call for a concerted effort at doing so. Rather, this presentation follows in earnest the Arendtian invocation, think we must, as well as her calls to forget theories, because they might limit the vitality of the thinking mind. I first thought of this together with Martin after reading Giorgio Agamben's article, Invention of an Epidemic, published originally in, and I'll butcher this, Quodilbe. Agamben's intellectual posturing struck me as somewhat anachronous with what has been happening in the world. First, the claim that lockdown is importing the state of necessity into politics, thus inciting a state of collective panic, open and end quote, is worrying, and I cannot think about it without that Arendt's invocation of thinking without a banister in my mind. Yes, if observed through Agamben's theoretical framework, lockdown is prison, it is necessity. K. 
Can we, however, think of the COVID lockdown as a caesura in the post-World War II biopolitical theorizing? A sort of a new break with the tradition of theory Arendt spent so much time thinking about, but in a different context and for different reasons. A new direction, injunction, a scream, a call by a non-speaking agent, and yet by a doing agent. This is primarily so because lockdowns were instituted as acts of solidarity and indeed necessity, but primarily in the face of a certain dose of fear, the lack of knowledge with regards to virus, and a desire not to incite panic. The assuming control of state institutions to handle the pandemic is a move and an incentive not towards a collect pan collective panic, but towards dealing with an unknown. Second, not just because Agamben perceived the lockdown sort of as a prison, but also because he completely ignored the fact that the virus, i.e. the coronavirus, forced the soul in political theory to reevaluate the way of life we led until meeting its invisible and yet powerful gaze. I draw here off Foucault to posit an inspired but not strictly Foucauldian claim that virus here is not just a trope, but a real doing performing political agent. It is truly a moment of importance, I believe, when tropes become alive, become manifest. For example, Elizabeth Covinelli's virus is one of the three figures of what she terms geontology or geontopower, that is the investigation of the crisis of late liberal governance that rests on the idea that biopolitics and biopower are sustained by the distinction between life and non-life, livability and non-livability, that is emerging now from the crisis of liberal governance in relation to, although not exclusive to, the climate change. Additionally, Haraway's project of making kin, open and end quote, becoming a new political moment in a COVID world where uncanny imbrications bring forth new onto-epistemological orientations to the world. These two concepts are a break with the tradition of sorts, the tradition of humanist biopolitical theorizing that has become insufficient or inadequate or stretched afar and wide to understand power relations and relations more broadly when faced with the non-life, non-human, invisible. I refer here primarily to the real effects of the pandemic that ought to be observed from the body, and I'll come to this uh, statement in a second, this body. More than 800,000 dead, according to the European Center for Disease Control, economies awaiting a cool, cold autumn and winter, and potential changes to the work paradigm with the success of digital platforms to sustain huge numbers of remote workers. We can actually associate with this as most of us are somewhere in any space between as the loose would have it in the virtual work world. But what do we mean by the view from the body? By the view from the body, we primarily refer to a strand of theorizing in feminist techno science studies, starting with Donna Haraway and Karen Barrett, and critical anthropological studies borrowing from Marilyn Strathern and Hassan Haj. The body is not understood here as a sexualized, gendered body necessarily. Rather, the body is understood as what Haj terms corporeality, the reality of physical properties that have um, agency, or the physical properties of agents themselves. We live in a trope, we live in a metaphor somehow, and there is some value in staying with it to see how it unravels. This is what makes me think of the virus as a doer, its body a corporeality that acts. Following Donna Haraway, there is value in saying um, that we are now relationally choreographed by the virus in a kind of an ontological dance where viral outbreaks determine or steer the course of political life. It is a bumpy road as the virus open and end for just wants to live, to borrow from John Green's podcast, The Anthropocene Reviewed. It is important to ask what it is that its life is doing to other lives, for example, human life, and modes of existence, in our case, humanist westernized politics, in order to get at a more polished political theorization of post-humanist understanding of the virus's political agency. If heeded, the performativity of virus's political agency can allow us to look beyond traditional political categories, biopolitical categories like the state, territory, and population, although it does not exclude them necessarily and into how biopolitical, understood here as the power of bios, the vitality of bios, theorizing, must become even more decentralized in understanding power relations, and beyond that, at understanding relations in general. 
It is precisely here that I would like to situate a poorly, very poorly named, but ambitious thought machine that we call negative biopolitics. I will not deal here in detail with biopolitics as Martin will tackle this issue in more depth, but it is important to write a few things in order to set the parameters right for negative biopolitics. First, we are inspired by Donna Haraway, where her affirmative biopolitics is, open quote, about finitude and about living and dying better, living and dying well, and nurturing and killing best we can in a kind of openness to relentless failing, end quote. Haraway continues discussing both the making kin, that is, applying affirmative biopolitics to the operation of forging relations between uncanny kinships, between uncanny collaborators, um, in order to live and die better in the precarious age of today. Here, humans are just a species being, one of the species on the planet and not the primary subject of thinking and analysis. However, she also talks about affirmative biopolitics as trying to understand power not through the prism of thanatopolitics, where power is to be able to kill, but rather where power is to be able to... Thank you. Thank you, Pedro Valle but rather where power is to be able to force one to live for value extraction amongst other reasons. Second, negative biopolitics enters here as the opposite of the affirmation, but also its close cousin. It is a power of the non-human understood or treated here as a virus to kill and the responsibility of others, that is in this case humans, to understand better the working of the virus, to heed its call, make its presence known. That is, affirm the virus by understanding its power through understanding relations that negate existence of other forms of life. In short, where Haraway talks about making kin, we talk about what kind of quality that making constitutes in the biopolitical thought, as in, should all life be let to live and why? And if let to live, what does it do to other forms of life and organization? Negative biopolitics here permeate spectrums from bios to chaos, neoliberalism, communism, modernity, postmodernity, understood as not strict binaries, but obviously there is a binary in, in, implicit and inherent in them. To understand how figurations of human and non-human institutions and modes of existence have been fighting an invisible battle with the uncanny outside, where the invisible agents make their presence known. I hope today's debate, in earnest, will help us come closer to asking and answering questions like, how can we account for this from our current standpoint? How can we think this in today's day and age? I leave the floor open to Martin to make us think harder about these issues. Thank you very much. Um, what I will try to do is uh, to further develop points made by Tony and to come to the same conclusion as Tony, but from another point of view, which is in the first part of my presentation, focus on defining virus as a non-human agent. And in the second part, I connect my claim that virus is a non-human agent to the notion of negative politics, biopolitics, beautifully presented by Tony. News that coronavirus is atypical and more deadly than its predecessors was soon accompanied by rather strange words like war, fight, battle. The starkest examples are the ones given by French President Emmanuel Macron and Slovenian Prime Minister Janis Janša. The former informed its fellow citizens that they are at war with the virus. The latter seemed to have no problem stating virus has no privacy. Military discourse at the moment seemed unrelated to the infection disease. But soon, the alarm went off in my mind and questions were raised. How can one be at war with a virus? Is it not that one is usually at war with other human beings? Can one be at war with a non-human? What does it mean to be at war with a non-human agent? Infectious diseases have been intertwined with war discourse ever since, but not just discourse, in real life as well the second half of the 19th century, when medicine and hygiene developed as scientific fields and immensely improved the quality of everyday life. Ever since, immunology has been intertwined with war metaphors. Philippe Sarasan states that, in fact, war became master metaphor and, along with terms like invasion and foreign invaders, 
all too familiar from the recent refugee crisis, which is no accident, generates narratives about bodies, subjects, and societies. These narratives tell us stories of our societies in terms of war and survival, where society needs to defend itself from the invisible enemy by using different intelligent defense systems. The link with European Union, and I put this in brackets, migration politi politics and policies, and anti-immigrant discourse derives its semantic force from the same master metaphor. Silvia Berger highlighted that at the turn of the last century, one of the founding fathers of modern bacteriology and immunology, Robert Koch, surprisingly stated, started a campaign against typhus, referring to it as war. Bacteria causing typhus had to be fought against as one fights war. Koch and his followers strived to eradicate the bacteria discursively and materially, as they were also funded by the Second Reich. The alliances between bacteriology, medicine, and military included the use of bacteriological discoveries in the field of medicine and ministry of war. For example, younger sanitary officers in the Second Reich served their term for several years in the health office, Gesundheitsamt, and bacteriology was part of military institutions and broader social world of politics and economy. What is more, in the context of colonization, the immunology and medicine were developed as disciplines to subordinate and exterminate the enemy species, as Haraway reminds us. Colonization, primarily European economic enterprise, was also ecological, as Crosby pointed out. Infectious diseases and weeds like smallpox and pantango played important role because they decimated the indigenous populations animals and plants, and at the same time enabled food for the settlers and their important imported species. Biopolitics, as we define it, is killing of some species and their betterment of life for the others in this context. It is not limited to human life, but life and its processes in general. Lazzarato points out that biopolitics is not superior to social political relations, but it is embedded in them. Foucault mentioned in the discipline and punishment the amalgamation of capitalism and biopolitics since the end of 18th century. Capitalism needed healthy population and needed to sustain the health of population in order to sustain its mode of production. Arendt, who came to very similar findings, but only, not only, 20 years prior to Foucault, pointed out that at the same time, the field of necessity and maintenance of basic human life processes took precedence over the sphere of politics and freedom. Blurred distinction between political and necessity resulted in the emergence of the category of social. Unclear division between state and society in the 19th century operated under the terms of metaphor of state as organism which was flexible enough to offer liberal conservative compromise, as Koselec reminds us. These findings remind that it is demand us to think of biopolitics as embedded in social, political, and ecological processes, not only because the state could be conceptualized and could actually work in terms of organism metaphor, but also because ecological processes are substantial for the field of necessity and political action. Social political relations drastically changed since the 19th century, and the virus has shown the debilitating consequences of the decaying welfare state, financialization of markets, monetization of all spheres of life, etc. Taking into account the historical, discursive, and material forces that shape the fight against infectious diseases in military sense, it is not surprising that coronavirus has been fought against in terms of war. But this time, very openly, the virus operated as non-human agent because it forced established political and economic order to hold and change its basic parameters. For example, like the dominance of online communication became pervasive, economic dropout happened all over the globe, and suspense of public life, and which is really the most obvious thing, extreme decrease in air pollutants, something that no climate conference has succeeded to do so far. 
This is only possible. Can you, can you repeat the sentence, please? But this time, virus operated as non-human agent because it forced the established political and economic order to fall and change its basic parameters. Dominance of online communication, economic dropout, suspense of public life, extreme decrease in air pollutants. Something that no climate conference has succeeded to do so far. And this climate conference refers specifically to extreme decrease in air pollutants. This is only possible in the world where political activities are not dependent solely on political actors understood as humans, but also on physical laws as Dalby states. And we would add on biological and ecological processes. Coronavirus pointed out that non-human biological actors can substantially change the sphere of politics. Along with that, Donna Haraway astutely pointed out that biopolitical is intertwined with ecological because humans are connected with other species as we are companions at risk with each other. We depend on bacteria in our digestion and on plants that produce oxygen that we need to survive. The entanglement of humans in the web of biological and ecological processes is to be understood in the broader frame of the emergent, emergence of science in the beginning of early modern age, where, when, as Hannah Arendt stresses, the progress and the nature of sciences shattered the notion of human as the center of the world and accounted him as part of natural and scientific processes beyond his control. Even though the entanglement of biological and ecological is profoundly shaped by human activity, the living and dying of humans, plants, animals, fungi, and bacteria cannot be controlled by humans, was it ever. This, in effect, leads to unintended and intended destruction and extermination, in one word, to necropolitics, as Niels Bubant defines it. However, the entanglement of biopolitical and ecological should be understood as call for different biopolitics. One that does not design new ways of making some species, the ones unuseful for, for humans or capitalist production, more killable, elucidates Haraway. And let me again use the same quote by her that my comrade mentioned in his part of the presentation, and I quote, but I think and affirmative biopolitics is about finitude and about living and dying better, living and dying well and nurturing and killing best we can in a kind of openness to relentless falling." End of quote. Failing, pardon. Here I build upon Tony's argument about negative biopolitics a step further from affirmative biopolitics. We are not only interested in better living and dying, but to examine the processes of living of non-human and non-living in the inert nature, as Pominelli defines it. We want to examine the crossroads of bio and geos in relation to political sphere that has for too long neglected the non-living part of our planet. Political sphere that is now forced to engage with non-human, non-living seriously. This non-human and non-living threatens to eradicate human activity. The activity which transformed the inert nature to the brink of six great species extinction and its own destruction. Thank you. Give us one second, we can catch us all in the frame. Bonjour. <laughs> okay. I'm back. We are socially distancing in a way that all three of us are within one meter. Yes. <clears throat> but this is our <coughs> approach. Okay. Are there any questions within the room? I think. Have one that I still have to say because it was just. Too many much. concepts at the same yes. time. Yes. Well, would you like to come here because I'm not sure that. that... We have a custom actually. We can pose a, a question even the following year. That's fine. <laughs> <That's> fine. <laughs> We're probably going to stick with this for a little while. It's a very tense. Okay, this is project. Uh, are there any questions from the Zoom participants? 
Okay. I think also someone uh, bring one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have two questions from our Zoom participants. Uh, unfortunately, I'm short-sighted, <laughs> so so I'll have to read. Uh, yeah, I think that Yadna was was the first. Yes. Shoot. I would like to ask you if you, um, if I understood correctly, um, you need, uh, you think that divide between politics and uh, nature is something what we need or that something which must be abandoned in some kind of way? What do you think about... Uh, can we both answer this question? Yeah, yeah. Is that okay with you? I think we lean closer more to the second one, but we're careful about it. Because even though that the, the binary between exclusive zone and the political and the ostensibly rudimentary pristine form of natural should be in a way abandoned. There is also kind of carefulness about how we abandon it, which is precisely where we enter with our kind of move away from Haraway because she puts them all together. And we want to say yes, but let's, in, in, uh, let's interrogate the quality of these relations. What happens when kind of the natural and the political are in a way enmeshed, entangled, um, what she would say at stakes with each other. You, Martin will also want to. Yeah, I also uh, agree with Tony said, we lean more to the second option because nature is something that political relies on without nature, no matter how now I conceptualize it. This is something that sustains life, is part of our life. And like, if we completely neglect it or eradicate it, there would be no political in order to in terms of these basic life processes. That's what I think we have to take into account because for far too long, like I said, politics was understood, okay, the human activity, what we think, what we do, but now it has come with like, what we as humans have done has come back from the behind like a and like a boomerang and haunts us and threatens us to eradicate the life as we know it and possibly also human life in terms of climate change because we know that oceans are dying, they're acidic, air pollution is skyrocketing, skyrocketing and so far. So how can we talk and be political when at the same time we don't take into account the effects of processes that we started and threaten to diminish what we have accomplished? And terms. not just us. And not just us, yeah, whole system. but whole systems. Yeah, but you, Martin, mentioned this uh, um, example from uh, Second Reich. Yes. When uh, medicine was so embedded in politics, uh, what do you think about this? Like some, I don't know, historical experience and related uh, to my previous question. Well, we depend on, uh, I didn't catch the last part. Um, if we abandon this divide, yes, also analytically, then we don't have any distinction what is <laughs> uh, human or non human, and I think politics is uh, especially something that happens between happen between human beings i would be cautious here precisely because when we say humans what do we mean by humans and this may be my fault because i come from queer theory feminism in pro-structural sense and i that's all it was also kind of our aim to deconstruct this strict humans. divide Yes. between the human and non-human and also what it means to be human because far too long we have think of human as a specific kind of human that has caused and prevented other humans to enter the sphere of political and also decimated whole populations of humans and species that accompany them. That's why I'm 
not so keen on like being so strict about this divide between political and nature. There's a, there's a, if I may just add for one more second, if I'm not interrupting anyone, there's a strong decolonial drive, um, an anti-racist kind of drive in all of this. Anti-racist. Decolonial ah, decolonial. and anti-racist drive in all of this theorizing that stems partly from Donna Haraway's earlier wor work on cyborgs, uh, where cyborgs are people who belong, but simultaneously do not belong in a kind of Western patriarchal Marxism matrix. Uh, yeah, and also Sylvia Winter's work, which we plan on including in the paper, but just didn't have enough space to fully outline here. So it's not that we destroy, and actually that's something I'm, I'm very careful and at times against, uh, destroying kind of the binaries of kind of nature, culture, nature and politics, but we want to look at how they figure relative to each other, because we definitely live in an age where these things cannot be clearly excluded anymore, just like that, politically and it changes the face of politics. I hope that's it. Uh, Ringo? Yeah, hello. Uh, thank you for uh, both of you and the rich talks you gave. Um, very impressive, I think. Um, but um, I have so many questions regarding the um, dependency to Hannah Arendt because um, Hannah Arendt divided very strong between a sphere of nature and a political sphere, sphere. So political sphere as what regards to the is something uh, of of the people of uh, of talking of argumentation, and we can't argue with a virus. We can't argue with nature. We can't um, do anything like that. Um, and I'm still wondering how, and I'm totally on your side that it's, it's important to think about that, but I'm still wondering how should we put it in a, in a, political, ma in a political manner to, to make it a political subject, to um, make it, make it in, a, in a way real that the virus has an agency which he hasn't there is no agency there is no i have I, I like to do that because i'm the virus it's just happening and um so <clears throat> what, what what would you suggest or what would you say to um to make it political to to design the framework to understand what's happening and what's going on in our world in a political way and to make it as a political theme. Is there something you you think about uh, or you have in mind? Excuse me, maybe I'm, I'm still a bit confusing. Yeah, it's something, thank you for your question. It's something we're absolutely thinking about. I disagree in your reading of Arendt, although this is not an Arendtian paper per se. We are influenced by some of her writing and theorizing. My own PhD is more strictly to relate it, related to taking art and outside of this deliberative sphere necessarily. Mm -hmm. And this has been done in so many ways by people like um, Dana Villa, for example, in particular, where he talks about Arendtian politics as performative, disclosive, etc. cetera. I, I do not think that politics is just deliberation. I think as George Kateb writes actually about Hannah Arendt, what, what she thought about politics is about big changes, big things. And there's this incredible part in her personal correspondence. I don't exactly know. I think it's featured in, I forget exactly where it's featured, but I can find it for you if, if, if we so require it. But I do remember the kind of the paraphrase it is where she says that the political changes with time and that it doesn't have the strict parameters of necessarily what political is. Um, obviously this requires a more a looser interpretation of Hannah Arendt, which for example, people like Elizabeth Povinelli do, who are inspired by Hannah Arendt uh, greatly, and also Donna Haraway inspired by Arendt's idea of visiting as judgment, so that we have to go outside of ourselves to think of the non-human as doing something in order for us to be able to understand how, for example, the breakdown of ecological change, the deforestation can bring forth different different actants, as Bruno Latour would have it, agents, as Haraway would have it, etc. Bill Colony forces, he defines it as forces, that can actually change the structure, not just of political, but of life in general. 
And this, this has great um, repercussions for politics, because let's not idealize it. I don't think politics is just about the liberation. Politics is generally in so many places and in so many spaces. Um, I think it also depends on your definition of agency. It is something very contentious because we do not treat these agents as purposive, agents with intent, agents that can think, but in replication of virus, there is some sort of agency or even Bill Connolly calls it a force, some sort of a force that can broadly be fit within the agential paradigm. And this is, I think, important. This is precisely why we want to go into kind of this more loose interpretation of biopolitics to kind of be able to grasp theoretically and politically theoretically how and what it does, but predominantly how, because that involves a relational perspective on the world, not just a cause and effect, but how is that cause and effect related to other cause and effect, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. I'm not going to this, but Martin also wants to. I'll just have a short remark just, yeah, we can't argue with nature, with virus, but then again, if we didn't stop or go into lockdown, the virus would cause much more havoc than it did. So we were forced to negotiate, to negotiate yeah. either risk huge loss of human lives or, as we did, <coughs> try to prevent life. And second of all, yeah, the way Hannah Arendt conceptualizes um, agency and political action derives and comes from European um, philosophical traditions. However, in pre-modern animistic societies, they take very seriously plants, ghosts, etc. And they give them another kind of agency because they don't see things hierarchically as we do. So this is something that also we need to take into yeah. account. Mm -hmm. It's a de-dramatization of human subjectivity, I think, in, in politics. That's how Claire Colbrook refers to it. So I think we take that as well. Sorry. Yeah, uh, Nick, 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 Hello. 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 Uh, yeah, this was fascinating, but I completely disagree. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that is I mean, if you what claim you this, you don't understand anything about what Hannah Arendt says about politics. Mm -hmm. and that, <laughs> sorry. Um, I mean, the main problem that I see is uh, is terminological, of course. It's about the grip. It's mm -hmm. about how we call something and how. Mm -hmm. uh, as a consequence, we understand it. So it's a, the, the sole category of agency is the problem. Mm -hmm. Because what you do, you impose on Hannah Arendt conception of handling a political activity mm -hmm. as a genuine human activity among humans. You impose something that she would just call activity as such. So, okay, you will tell me. Yes. So, I, I, I think that um, if you if you say that if you call the virus agent, which is a purely chemical mm -hmm. notion, it's a chemical uh, 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 category. So agents mix in a chemical Bias. reaction, which is a process which we might control mm -hmm. in the uh, uh, laboratory, but we might not control them if they go out of laboratory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is. For example, she explains this when she speaks about the atomic bomb, when yes. the natural processes, yes. uh, you know, because the humans actually acted right. into nature, have become, uh, we, we cannot manage them anymore. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, they went out of the laboratory and that's the problem, basically. And the, and the modern science, she explains exactly through this, yes. which is connected with what Zoran was talking yesterday. So I think that, uh, the agency as such, activity as such, is non-political. It's a purely natural or social phenomenon. And she, in Vita Activa, in, in the, on human condition, mm -hmm. uh, she, in the last chapter, she explains very clearly what happens when, when, uh, 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 when, action, when action is actually disappearing and replaced Mm -hmm. by activity as such, mm -hmm. which is doing experiments, which is actually, so this is, basically this is what she called biopolitics. 
So this is one point I would make. Okay. So the other point is that how you explain her notion of politics now is purely Schmittian. We didn't explain her notion you, of politics. Yeah, you spoke that you can uh, you can talk with an island about virus as an agent which is political. You connected this with other, at, at least Martin. If, if it's war, then it's friend and foe and so No, 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 but that's no, not no, the I, I didn't, We're I didn't, not talking I didn't about that. Okay. Yeah, okay. sorry. Yeah, but you, you speak about the virus as a politi political agent, which is contradictio in a depth of it. Mm -hmm. So, yes, if virus is political, it is not because it's agent. Mm -hmm. I think I mean that that's that's the that's the main thing. Otherwise, you, I mean, I I don't want to go deeply into this, but mm -hmm. I think the very basic problem is the imposing of and of, of Schmittian, Schmitt, Foucauldian, Schmitt, Schmittian, Foucauldian, Agambian understanding of biopolitics on Hannah Arendt's notion of a process. Okay. Yeah. So I mean that's the basic because she clearly distinguishes between behavior and politics, be, be, between uh, processes and human activity. Mm -hmm. yes. I mean human I action, not activity. So uh, you yeah, basically you would have to make a distinction between pure activity as such, mm -hmm. which is virus, because it doesn't mm -hmm. take care about you know humans or non-humans or whatsoever, and action. Yeah. So, and this is related with, with also with, uh, of course, with Yanea's uh, uh, question. I think that's that's basically the basic question. Mm -hmm. How we understand nature and, you know, where if we want to keep the difference between politics and nature or mm -hmm. not. Yeah. Just uh, briefly to add to that, to the last actually, what you said actually, when you brought people actually, then you might ask yourself to, who is the agent, you know. So, in order to, like, not the virus in itself, is an agent, but you know the, the human capacity actually but really not agent, the difference between agent and actor. And uh, that is absolutely true, but actor and that's yes. that's words apart. Okay. Yes. I do I do actually you but can no, no, just yeah. just briefly to the distinction like this. So I'm not referring to this kind of etymological place yes. so the language meaning, but rather philosophically you might how how, how something makes things Possible or impossible, how it spreads, you know, how it affects yeah, all yeah, of us, yeah, yeah. us we human beings, you know, yes, so basically yes. not like that's why we if we want to prevent viruses, it's very hard to distinguish the the, the delineate in the sense, you know. I if think you want to prevent virus, you need to prevent people of, of uh, social socializing or whatever yeah. come together. I think that both of you in a way, much as I actually both I think Martin and I at last I especially agree with your interpretation about it. We agree. And we don't take her process of action from, say, we don't read it, we don't impose Agamben for coin, we actually move away from that. Mm -hmm. And we actually, I am, what I'm doing. Yeah, like, you spoke, sorry, you spoke about this loose interpretation, which is losing everything. It's I not mean, losing everything. It gains problem. a new meaning because that is that is when the biopolitics as a co concept doesn't allow you to understand anymore what's happening of in the world. Of course not, because you are losing what is said we, there. But, we're not, we're actually staying away from it intentionally because we think it doesn't account for these things. And in imposing, when you say that we're imposing the concept of agency on um, Hannah Arendt's concept of process, actually we don't action, want to, action, action, sorry, action process. as process. We don't want to do that. Actually, we are sticking to what Whitehead, well, what Arendt borrows from Whitehead, the concrescence and the processes that happen. And early on, Dana Villa, as, as not early on, later on, sorry, in the 90s, Whitehead was in the 20s, um, Hannah Arendt's concept of political action is disclosive and performative. What does the virus disclose? It is not uh, a political agent in and of itself, but its existence outside of the outside, its interpolation into the public sphere, into the healthcare system, discloses something. Part of it can be, we can argue, the lack of the development of the welfare state, shitty healthcare systems, if I can express myself this way. Part of it can be the lack of, the, the actually the entrenchment of Schmittian logic, us and them, that was the case in the early days of the pandemic in the EU, when all the countries immediately closed their borders without respecting the Schengen rules and all of these things. I think 
And also, if I may add, I think that you're, we are not so fundamentally inspired by Arendt, as you say, but that we are not developing concept of agency out of Arendt necessarily. We, we started thinking against Agamben because of Arendt in the first place, but we're fundamentally inspired by people like Donna Haraway who take further these notions. I don't um, understand basically what she means. Sorry. Yeah. So I think, much as I agree with you, I think you read a bit too much uh, Arendt on a fundamental level too, as we, we don't fundamentally. Not fundamental. Yeah. It's, it's just, you know, trying to explain, you know, what's implied <coughs> there, because if you are saying that something is implied there, then you know, what is there which is not, there is a problem. How do you, what does that mean? We're not trying to. I think I explained. I explained. If you actually say that mm. agent is action, politic, in a political way, and now you describe again this. Uh, We're not saying concept. that. We're if not saying that. Last it's political, it's political. Of course, but that's Schmidtian concept. We're not saying. Schmidt is saying there is a political, and everything can become political, which I doesn't say. And you are saying it's actually this. Everything, including the Earth's nature, everything can be. Political. But that's precisely where we don't stick to Arendt necessarily, but yes, we should. But we, stick to Schmitt, we, should we do not. not stick to Schmidt, we stick to Caraway, who okay, develops it from. Yeah, okay. doesn't matter. In any event, uh, you said something now, Yo, I really wanted to. I forgot, doesn't matter. Martin, you go ahead. Yeah, we do. Uh, wait a second. We do not claim that virus is on. Yeah, Yerne, I think, was also. Uh -huh. We do not claim that virus as non-human agencies is to be necessarily understood as enemy, but we do claim that they need to be taken seriously as something, as an entity that influences yeah. this fear of political, not necessarily to fight against this, but to live with it, because there are viruses and bacteria in us, just the question like when and how. To live with, right? To live yeah. with, yes. I agree completely with this. I mean, it really influences the sphere of the political. That's okay. But that's a statement that but that's should weird. be the conclusion of, of such a thing. So. But that's what I basically conclude. Yeah, with, okay. So. Yeah. It's just but, simple, yeah. Then, you know, it's very. So. And not that agent is action, but that is that virus as non human agent influences human action in this sense. Yes, and as such, the act of it, or actually, if we think of it relationally, the fact, for example, that human, let's take an example of deforestation, then we get more agents, well, no, we get more of these viruses, for example, out into the sphere, we're more potential dangers out there. That's a relational agency. That is not agency that's understood as just subject and object. Yes. It completely displaces and de-dramatizes the Western um, ontological divide between age, uh, object and subject, and it positions them, not on a Laturian flat scale, no, 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 not networks necessarily, I disagree with that, but relations, how one act or one move or one force impacts another, and where does that lead? You know, Arendt in the human condition says some, and she of course says some human actions can reverberate, can last virtually until the end of mankind, when we are trying to say yes, but, what, what, but that's precisely it. That's precisely what Martin was saying, is that humans, and because of Arendt's, for example, uh, critique of modernity, we've become a geological agent, a natural force. And what we do and what happens in the world is in turn relationally connected to some of the acts that we've started. And through that, there is a segmental agency that we can have on, on the virus. Between, between, again, activity and, and uh, action, there is a difference. And political action, and that's what you should think about. But okay, we want that's to think my about it. Yes, to we think. want to think about it. But don't it... merge and think about the difference to yes, between, yes. between acting into something, you know, and mm -hmm. just doing something and political action because there is a difference. It really this concept. If you don't want it, you can just, you know, throw it away, of course. No, no, so I think it's I a very think. useful. But part. that's where we're going to actually. We just don't want to necessarily no, stick. We didn't want to set you're not going there. No, just going the opposite direction. Sorry. No, I think we are we missing. Well, there's a difference in interpretation of both agency, what it constitutes, but also relations as something constitutive of agency. We more draw, kind of, we're more inspired by people. Actually, also, Arendt was inspired by the Whitehead. 
etc. But I think Yerneya and, and Volkan no, were... Yeah, but I would no. like to give word to Volkan because he okay. yeah. already asked a question. Yeah. So Volkan, please. You are mute, Volkan. Volkan, unmute yourself, please, and ask the question. <coughs> Okay, as far as I understand the problem in, if we take Hannah Arendt for this um, problem, the problem I see that Hannah Arendt never talked about how to deal with necessity problems. And this is somehow um, mathematical or administrative affairs. She never talked about say, what? Hmm? She never talked about what? I apologize. I didn't hear about, you. About politicizing or how to deal. So the, the, the housing question, for example, in a, in a talk, in the discussions, she said housing questions is something for administration, this is not political. Yeah. I would, uh, this is very exclusive. So I would more take the, 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 the path of uh, Zoran when he said, um, talking about um, what happens, factual truth, and what are we doing with this in the interpretation, this is political, we are dealing politically with factual truths. So, is the virus factual truth? I think the factual truth is at least the globalization and the relationship between uh, cities and countryside and the, the extension of the population and the more and more contacts with viruses. So the virus is not coming from the outside of the world, but it's in, in our world and we are creating contacts. And this is a question of how do we live in relationship to ecology, and the ecology of the virus, as well as the ecology of, of warming, world warming, climate, climate warming, climate change, and so on. Yeah, that's exactly what we're getting at with this. Did you have this, a this includes This includes also the question you already mentioned now of the social welfare state. So this is also a political question. How do we deal with biopolitics negatively or positively? with the protection of the, of the population. So in, in Brazil, in the United States, yes. Great Britain, we have the, the, the crazy politicians and the irresponsibility. And last year I presented a paper about the sustainability of ecology in, con in, in the context of the sustainability of the Republic. So Hannah Arendt meets Alexander von Humboldt. Mm -hmm. This means that we have a political question here, how which society can deal in a good way with these challenges. It's more the sustainable republic, former uh, denomination, is a social welfare state, mm. uh, as, as an alternative to the liberal irresponsibility. No. I think that to, to go on from you, I actually fully agree with what you said. And there's, there's a brilliant book that's very inspiring, for me at least, and I know Martin is about to start reading. It's called The Shock of the Anthropocene by um, Jean-Baptiste Fressoz and Christophe Bonouin, and they do basically a history, an altered history, of precisely what you just said, Wolfgang, of relations of ecology, the state, industrial capitalism, and they present the outgrowth of, for example, industrial capitalism as a political struggle within the conceptions of nature in the Western society. And I think that is also, I mean, that is something biopolitics emerged out of these Western conceptions. That's something we're trying to take, but criticize and distance ourselves from. But thank you. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a great intervention. Okay, Kevin, may I ask a question? Because, you know, I, I see that you're asking a second question. So I'll you. give you one. Uh -huh. I think I should have a right to ask a question. Yeah, if you can speak. Yeah. And I'm giving myself that right. So, would the agency of virus change if the entire planet was communist? Communist. Is that a trick question? No, it's not. No, it's not. Because biopolitics is in the way in which you present it. Mm -hmm. It's related to capitalism. Mm -hmm. And we are fighting a war, as you present it. Well, we virus. didn't, but we're troubled with the virus. Yeah. Okay, so my question is, would the agency of virus change if the entire planet was communist? The virus in and of itself has no agency. It is the effects. Of absolutely. It this is out. exactly what my question is. It's a disclosure to. of yeah. what it does in the system that so is it important. Won't. Yes, in a probably okay. communist system would deal differently okay. than, let's say, America. Okay, now, now I'm getting your argument. This is yeah. why I asked the question. Yes. 
So the agency, the agency of virus is not the agency of virus. Disclosive performance. If you have to say about Anna Arendt, Dana Villa, Arendt, Heidegger, disclosive performance. Because that's why you would be able to, in addition to Donald, sorry, you would be able to talk about capitalism. Sorry, but... Sorry. Sorry, sorry. I think that Yanea was first. Okay, thank you, Yanea. Ringo has a... Yes, um, I'm thinking about something Arendt uh, wrote in her letters to Jaspers and uh, and Heinrich. Um, there is some, sometimes she mentions something like that, the world history hit us uh, and we have to do this and that. Which she, she means with that, that there is something unex, unexpected which came in, in a in her way of her living. So like the Second World War, or like the Earth to be a refugee, something happened which was so un unexpected that she had to deal in, uh, with life in another way. Yeah. And I think <clears throat> that's exactly what you mean with uh, having an agency. It's like there is something we can't control. Yeah. And the aren't <coughs> would be how could we deal it in a political way and deal it with a, to deal it in a political way would arise the question as we as we discussed it in germany would we value the life higher or the possibility to argue in an open space and germany during the lockdown valued the life higher this is a political decision yes. not to be free and to argue it's uh, argue uh, somewhere. So if you could find in your uh, research such moments where these world history hitting or the, the virus or kind of that, where it came to a political question, a political decision, that would be, I think, more fruitful in a way to, to adapt it to an Aryan the theory. Um, so that's I would suggest that. For this. this is a great intervention. Thank you very much for this. Very, very helpful. But it also depends on whether we really want to stick strictly with Arendt. And in a way, we might, maybe, but we still have a few more. Of course, of course that's up to you. But I, 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 that's what I ha had in mind. Thank um, you. That's a great remark. Thank you.